Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our audience here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. My name is Eric Anderson. I'm the director of Voices in Leadership. This series focuses on the lessons of effective leadership to create positive change in public health. And today we host a discussion on inclusive excellence at Harvard and beyond with Dr. Sarah Bleich and our guest, Dr. John Wilson. John Sylvanus Wilson, Jr. currently serves as Senior Advisor and Strategist to the President of Harvard University. In 2017, he served as President in Residence at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where he conducted research for a book about the future of American higher education with an emphasis on the nation's historically black colleges and universities. As the 11th President of Morehouse College, Wilson led a team that successfully increased applications, stabilized and expanded enrollment, and elevated the graduation rate. Wilson previously served as the executive director of the White House Initiative on HBCUs. Between 2001 and 2009, he was an associate professor of higher education at the Graduate School of Education at George Washington University. He started his career in 1985 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he currently serves on the Harvard Board of Overseers on leave. He holds degrees from Morehouse College, Harvard Divinity School, and the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Dr. Sarah Bleich, please join me as we welcome Dr. John Wilson to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Dr. Wilson, welcome. It is wonderful to have you here. Thank you. And Thank I want to start with your charge, which is big, from yeah. the Presidential Task Force on Inclusion and Belonging. Mm -hmm. And as you think about this first year, can you give us a sense of what success might look like? Uh, in some ways, that's, uh, that's hard to define. I can tell you that it is uh, the success we'll have in year one will be largely under the radar, uh, simply because uh, what you have to do, and you keep in mind, we're trying to change culture. Harvard is 382 years old. And uh, for most of that time, for 340 of the 382 years, it has been basically catering to one audience, uh, the privileged sons of the New England aristocracy early on, and then other white males for most of the time. It was only 40 years ago, 40 to 50 years ago, that Harvard brought in, let's say, other audiences previously excluded. That would be women, uh, students of color, and other students of difference started going international. So for 380 of, year, of the 382 years, there's been, um, you know, a set culture at Harvard. Two years ago, Drew Faust said, you know what, maybe we ought to think about our approach to the education here and adjust it in some interesting ways so that more people are in a position to flourish. So uh, our task is to try to put in place in the initial set of years um, some initiatives, some new infrastructure, some scaffolding to try to change a culture that has been in formation for 382 years. <laughs> So what you're going to see in the first year uh, may be somewhat uh, limited, but we're trying to put some people in place, build some relationships, and go at the kind of cultural change we're, we're, we're looking for. Well, I wish so. you all the best with that. Well, uh, in fact, you know, I, I, I talk about the history and the way that I do, not to say that we're intimidated yeah. in the least. We believe in what we're doing. The timing is right to do this. Uh, there was a recognition that not everybody um, in the Harvard community is in a position to flourish and do their best work. And uh, I'm quite pleased that Harvard has made the decision that that's got to change. And that's what this is about. So in some past interviews, you've talked about the holy grail of higher education, no. where one piece is how do you optimize the capital, the buildings, the infrastructure, 
In the other piece is, how do you optimize the character of the people that you send out into the world? Yeah. And you've said that there's no place that has actually optimized both those things simultaneously. And so as you think about that character piece, sending out the right types of people into the world to make it a better place, what are the biggest challenges to doing that here? And, and how do you even start to overcome them? Uh, first, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, I will tell you where it comes from first. I, I attended Morehouse College undergrad, and Morehouse um, to me was the um, it was the most psychologically wholesome four-year period of my life. I, I had gone to um, K through 12 system in suburban Philadelphia. It was largely white, and I was othered uh, the whole time. Uh, I came to Morehouse, and it was quite different. Mm -hmm. I was quite in focus, and uh, I felt like the place was there for me, was built for me. And, uh, and there was this emphasis. What drew me to Morehouse was uh, uh, Martin Luther King had gone there, the picture of character. And, um, and you could see how the institution itself, the way it approached the undergraduate experience, made an investment in not just setting up the person for a living, but for life, mm -hmm. to, to get them to take seriously the task of, um, of being a force for good in the world. You're obligated. I mean, Dr. Bleich, my classmates include um, uh, Jay Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, Homeland Security Secretary, um, and, and Spike Lee, mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King III, people who have been consequential in this world. There are a number of other people uh, I could name, but I won't start naming Morehouse men like that. Because you work at Harvard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do, and I'm trying to give some Morehouse to Harvard here. Mm -hmm. We'll talk so, about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I, think, I think the issue is, um, you know, this character preeminence is what, is what I saw in mm -hmm. Morehouse, mm -hmm. and then I came to, to Harvard for grad school, and I I looked around and saw these buildings and saw this big endowment, uh, these well-paid um, faculty members with a productive life lifestyle and students who didn't care about where the money was coming from because it was taken care of. And I said, you know what, Harvard needs exactly what Morehouse has, the character preeminence, and Morehouse needs exactly what Harvard has, the capital preeminence. And I started to focus on that as I pursued a master's and doctorate here, and, and I concluded that there's no institution that has optimized them both mm -hmm. on the same campus at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, um, that's it right there. That's what we need to do. Now, my agenda as President Morehouse was to add significant capital preeminence to a place that has already defined itself based on character preeminence. Uh, and I won't get into the, the issues, uh, but the, I think the bottom line is I see my time here at, uh, at Harvard as uh, uh, strengthening the character preeminence of Harvard. Now, your question is how? How do you do and that? And what's the biggest challenge? And what's the biggest challenge? I think, I think in this situation, the biggest challenge has been met, and that is to get the leadership on board. at Harvard mm -hmm. on board with this. The leadership is on board. This agenda that, that Drew Faust outlined and that, that Larry Bacow has now embraced and is going to be, you know, 2.0 with mm -hmm. it, um, is about character preeminence. How do you, wh how do we adjust the undergraduate and the graduate educational experience to position more people to flourish, to position them to thrive, to position them to do their best work while becoming their best selves. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of this. And that is, I believe, uh, the formula at Morehouse. So now that we have Larry back out, and the deans all generating strategic plans for how to get at inclusive excellence, all willing to survey um, Harvard-wide, how are people feeling about this? We're gonna do an annual survey. Those two, strategic planning and surveying, are gonna give us the combination of, of things we need to begin to make change mm -hmm. uh, throughout Harvard. So I'm confident as we build this infrastructure in the first year that we're going to uh, 
we're going to make progress. Once again, I do wish you good luck with that. <laughs> All, right. All, right. All right. So we're in a school of public health, yeah. and um, one of the things that we think about a lot here is mental health. Yeah. And so in the work that you do around inclusion and belonging, how do you think about mental health, particularly this idea that maybe people here just are unsettled or unhappy, there's the well-being piece, there's the more clinical side, yeah. but it's a big challenge for a lot of people, particularly when it comes to belonging and inclusion. Yeah. Well, first I should just make a comment about the School of Public Health. Um, I know that a lot of the graduates from this school are going into the world and, uh, and being a force for good. It's kind of the nature of the business mm -hmm. here, and I think that's a good thing. So um, uh, this is my first time here since I've uh, been in this role. I've been here a few times, and I, I truly respect uh, what you do here at the Harvard Chan. Um, on mental health, um, Dr. Bleich, I'll tell you a story. Um, I, I started, uh, I was here minding my business at the ed school, writing a book on the future of higher ed, emphasis on black colleges, and this is in the um, fall of 2017. And Drew uh, Faust called me in to, and asked me to read, read this report on inclusion and belonging. I read it, and we met, and uh, she said, I wanna, in, I wanna know if you're interested in helping us out, and I was, cool about it at first because I thought this was the diversity function. Um, and I didn't, throughout my career, I had seen that as in a certain place and I never saw it, saw myself doing it. Fast forward, um, she warmed me up to it. We paused because I didn't know who was going to succeed her. Mm -hmm. I said, Drew, you're leaving. I don't know. And then they chose Larry back out. Mm -hmm. And boy. Uh, <laughs> So I said, uh, we can get some things done, because mm -hmm. uh, Larry, as my, my kids would say, Larry's woke. Uh, he is woke. <laughs> he is woke on the Have right issue. you told issue. him that? Yeah. yeah, he's, yeah he, he, knows, he knows what it means, too. <laughs> Even better. Uh, so um, to get to your question, though, I, um, I, I didn't want to start until May, because I had some deadlines associated with, with the book. But I, I started in this position about three or four weeks before I intended to because of a mental health event. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, a student at Harvard had a mental health breakdown that morphed into him being criminalized mm -hmm. and beaten very badly. Mm -hmm. And this was on April 13th, Friday. I started working on that Monday, um, the 16th, uh, at six o'clock in the morning and have been working ever since. Wow. So my entry into this role was uh, triggered by a mental health event mm -hmm. that morphed into a criminal criminalization of, of a Harvard student. That right there um, captured a major part of the challenge we have here at Harvard University. First, we're going to be overhauling the way we do mental mental health. It has everything to do with well-being yeah. here at Harvard and why people, uh, a disproportionately high number of people, um, are not able to flourish mm -hmm. as much as they, they should. There was a headline just last week, I believe it was in the Crimson or the Gazette, about Asian American women uh, looking to have a mental health kind of intervention mm -hmm. because of the unique way in which um, they raise uh, their children, or women in particular, are, are raised to have um, high ambition, high pressure, high stress, and low support. Mm -hmm. That combination of things, they believe, has resulted in mm -hmm. a presentation of some mental health challenges mm -hmm. that are keeping them, as a group, from flourishing. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you, who would have thought that, right? Um, when, when the stereotype about Asians would suggest that they breeze right through in this model minority uh, kind of stereotype, which is unfortunate and too sweeping. but. I, I think it's a healthy thing that they're doing with that, and that also has presentations with other groups um, that, that present in different ways that make their experiences unique and may require a unique response 
institutionally. Mm -hmm. We're looking at all of that, and we'll be over here for, at Chan for some help and 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 what we should uh, what we should do. Very good. Yeah. So now I want you to put your Morehouse hat on, which yeah. I know you're very proud of. Yeah, I never took it off. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I suspect, and you talked about this a little bit with the character of preeminence, I suspect there is much that a place like Harvard can learn from a place like Morehouse. Yeah. And so when you think back to the points you're making about trying to maximize the experience here in terms of well-being um, and just enjoying being a faculty or student or faculty or faculty student or staff here at Harvard, yeah. what are some of the key lessons we can take from Morehouse that might be useful in this context? Well, I, I just think, uh, you know, I go back to that place where I was, um, I just finished, come out of the glow of Morehouse and came here to Harvard. And um, um, what I knew about Morehouse is that the minute I stepped onto that campus, um, they knew my name. Mm -hmm. right? um, they had seen me before. And I felt the place was built for me. Um, there is, I, I go to uh, a, a quote I used uh, as President Morehouse um, because it was true for me as a student at Morehouse, and it's from Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, um, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Right? And for for me, at Morehouse, I had my second day. I found out why, why I was born. I, I got on a pathway that, um, that became clear to me at Morehouse. The same is true for Spike. Um, Spike Lee was going, uh, he will tell you, he's told this story a number of times. He was going nowhere uh, his first two years. He went to Morehouse because his dad went to Morehouse. And he had exhausted all of his electives, hadn't chosen major, and uh, found a camera between his sophomore and junior year and used it that summer. It was the summer, summer of Sam. And, um, and came back, and I'll never forget this. He said, John, I know what I want to do. I said, what? He said, I want to make a film. He had his second day, mm -hmm. and he, he made a film before he graduated Morehouse, and, and, and the rest is history. Jay Johnson was my first commencement speaker at, at Morehouse was uh, Barack Obama. Wow. Uh, my second was Jay Johnson. It's a good lineup. Jay Johnson had just been chosen as Homeland Security Secretary, and he was my classmate, so I said, check. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Jay came down, and essentially his commencement address was about him having his second day at Morehouse. He, in his, at the end of his freshman year, it didn't take as long as Spike, at the end of his freshman year, <laughs> he just... He looked around. He wasn't that disciplined a student. And he saw all these guys who looked like him. And he said, you know what? I can do this. Mm -hmm. And he just cleaned himself up. Became, we became a very close friends. And he went and got straight A's, went to NYU Law, and the rest is history. I had my second day. I, there is such a thing, Dr. Bleich, as second day institutions. Mm -hmm. Institutions that specialize in giving students, putting things in place so that it is far more likely that they will discover for the first time why I was born. Part of our mission, one way to talk about it, is we're trying to make Harvard University the premier second day institution in the world. It is not now, but it can be. And if we elevate character preeminence to be on par with capital preeminence and we get the right things going on in the area of inclusion and belonging, I think we'll be there. You can wish me luck again, but. You don't need it. You don't need it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> So I want to switch gears again. Today mm -hmm. is election day, yeah. and it will likely be a historic election in terms of how many people are getting out to the polls yeah. and the level of interest around the country. Yeah. And the work that you do cannot be done in a vacuum. Right. And so as you think about the broader political context, how does it influence the work you do here at Harvard? Uh, well, you see my... Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm going you know, tonight. Yeah, yeah. I, um, you know, uh, 
there was something about, we understood this past summer that this was going to be a who are we fall mm -hmm. for Harvard. The admissions case challenged us. Um, it challenged, the, the admissions case has the potential to pull the rug out from under everything we're doing in inclusion belonging because it threatens the diversity foundation. I want to get to that next. All right. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to assert who we are. Um, this is a who are we moment for this country. And I believe the election is, uh, is capturing that. We're going to find out late tonight or tomorrow morning how most of the people in this country define progress. Um, some of us, myself included, feel that our greatness as a country is ahead of us. Some of us feel it's behind us. Mm -hmm. Um, I not only believe that our greatness as a country is ahead of us, I believe our greatness as Harvard University is ahead of us too. I insist that um, Harvard University was not at its best when it was excluding people for most of the 400 years we've been here. Women, students of color. There was a time when, when Harvard um, excluded only admitted so many Jewish students mm -hmm. in the 1920s. There was a time when Harvard, if you were suspected of having same-sex attraction, you were removed from Harvard, expelled. Uh, for most of Harvard's life, there were no women on campus. There were no students of color. I believe that the pathway we've been on for the last 40 or 50 years is in the direction of progress. The final challenge we have is to ensure that we harvest the intellectual fruits of the diversity we now have. Mm -hmm. Because the intellectual fruits of diversity do not harvest themselves. Right. So we are engaged in activities institutionally. We're engaged in a, on a pathway now to harvest those fruits and I believe you're going to see a, a far better Harvard than you've ever seen. Similarly, I believe this country and the pathway we, we've been on to really learn how to live together, um, uh, learn together, um, and make the world a better place together is the right pathway. There is now, and I don't have to tell you, it is pretty clear that the choice we have is to either vote for that pathway mm -hmm. or vote to go back in time and, and go to a place that ran counter to all of this, this uh, positive energy we have right now. I believe that's a mistake. Uh, and I, I hope that the uh, the uh, results of this election um, make it very clear what most Americans think. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful about that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so talk to us a little bit about the admissions lawsuit, particularly what it means for the work that you're doing. I, you know, it's, um, I went into the courtroom for the first time last week and I saw Drew Faust um, take the stand and give a full-throated um, um, statement of support for, for diversity. The stakes are very high, uh, Dr. Bleich. I think, um, um, I feel confident that the law is on our side, the facts are on our side, um, um, equity and equality are on our side, the vision of America is on our side, <laughs> so much is on our side. Um, um, I feel pretty confident about the, uh, the court it's in right now, but if it goes to the Supreme Court, um, there is reason to wonder what's going to happen. But here's, here's my bottom line. I think no matter what happens, Harvard is going to be Harvard. Mm -hmm. All right? This pathway we're on right now, we're going to figure out a way to stay on this pathway. And that's the bottom line. <laughs> you can clap. <laughs>
So this is actually, I want to end on an uplifting note. Um, it's been so nice to chat with you, and I suspect that there are a lot of black and brown people, either in the U.S. or around the world, that are listening to you speak, mm -hmm. that ask themselves, is Harvard the right place for me? And what's your message to them? My message is that Harvard is the right place. Um, I, I attended Harvard. Uh, I have a daughter who came out of here, undergraduate, and my son just started a PhD program here at Harvard. Um, if I didn't think it was the right place, um, I, I don't think I'd let my kids, uh, or <laughs> I would urge them not to. <laughs> it, it, it's the right place, and it's the right place particularly because of what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. This movement we have right now, Larry Bacow is the right president, and I have to tell you, I think this investment in inclusion and belonging is the right investment. We're on the right pathway to do what has not been done ever before. Uh, we've asked many of our audiences so far, various groups around Harvard, affinity groups and otherwise, and we've said, you know, who should Harvard be like in this regard? Uh, who is working with your constituency, whether it's women, um, Latinx, um, conservatives, um, other, all kinds of groups that we're dealing with, who is, which college or university has it right? And they all say none. There are best practices around. Stanford is doing some things better than we are and for first gens and various audiences. Our job right now is to converge the best practices. Mm -hmm and to become the model for everybody else. Now, Harvard wants to be number one in everything we try to do. Why not this, too? Mm -hmm. I believe this is the place and this is the time. So those, those uh, black and brown people and white, whatever, whoever you are, mm -hmm. um, Harvard is, uh, is a magnet uh, for you. And we're going to get better and better and better, and I'm confident about that. Well, we're going to have you back, and we're going to have you talk about all this progress. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so back. much. It was Thank such you. a pleasure Thank having you. Thank you.